James Knightley is with us. He's uh, Chief International Economist at ING. He's joining us now to take some questions. James, good to have you with us here. Good morning. Thanks very much for your time. Uh, you know, there's this uh, press conference in China underway. Uh, Ministry of Finance, PBOC and the housing uh, chaps. Uh, is, so expectations are well advertised in terms of that this is happening. Uh, but expectations are not very high. But generally, do you think it will keep interest alive in China and what may happen? Uh, because, you know, everyone has gotten a kind of a sneak peek, a preview into what can happen with that mad rally, violent rally that we saw in China a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so uh, what's your sense? Uh, will keep investors interested? Yeah, I think it will. Um, I mean, the Chinese economy has certainly been struggling um, this year. It's been a real disappointment. Um, and you can contrast the US with China quite easily because, of course, property market wealth, equity market wealth has soared in the United States uh, since the pandemic. Whereas, of course, in China, property wealth and equity market wealth has, has, has plunged, uh, to, to put it bluntly. Um, so that contrasting fortune for investors and particularly the household sector as well, uh, I think it really explains why China has been such a disappointing growth story um, this year, uh, really. So anything that can try and trigger a revival in sentiment towards China, trigger hopes of, of a rebound in growth um, has got to be viewed positively. I mean, so far it's been focused on the monetary policy fronts, a bit of tweaking around the edges perhaps today, uh, but I think markets are really hoping to see a, a broader fiscal package that can really start to get the Chinese economy motoring once again. Uh, James, hi. Uh, good to have you on. So what will it take to keep the market interest uh, as high? Because the market rallied some 30%. Now it's given off, I think, some 70% of that move already. What will the, the policy ma makers have to say to keep even this trading interest on? Policy front, um, you know, a few minor tweaks here and there is not going to really move the needle. Um, you know, it's not going to suddenly trigger big spending by Chinese consumers once again. Uh, we need to see a broader package. I mean, there's been various talk about uh, cash handouts to be given to to various groups, those sorts of things. That might be more of an, of an impact. But we've got to remember, China's actually got quite a lot of scope to offer more fiscal support. Government debt to GDP ratios are still pretty low. Uh, in China relative to most developed markets. So there is some scope. There is just a little bit of reluctance uh, right now, I guess, you know, about efficiency, about um, bureaucracy as well that causes some problems. But uh, in general, um, I think uh, there is some scope for, for China to offer a bit more uh, to, to, to get the economy motoring. But at the moment, there just seems a little bit of reluctance to deliver that. Hi, James. Morning. Good to see you in. Nigel on this side. You know, James, when we spoke a couple of times ago, you had hinted that 100 basis points is what you're factoring in, and you were factoring in a 50 basis points in September. Well, we got that from the Fed. But it appears now data is better than what, uh, you know, most were expecting. Jobs data is looking pretty okay. Inflation's cooling down as well. But what's the outlook from a year on? Do you expect another 50 basis points cut before the end of this uh, calendar year? We certainly do expect uh, 225 basis point cuts from here. The way, the way I'd characterise the Fed's uh, policy right now, it's one of a risk management perspective. Uh, the Federal Reserve in the United States is different to most of the central banks. Most central banks just have one target, get inflation down to 2%. Uh, in the US's case, they've got to do that, but they've also got to maximise employment as well. And if the Fed is confident that we're on the right track to 2%, it can start to pivot and put a little bit more emphasis on that second target. And in that regard, um, I think from a, the perspective that they don't want to cause a recession, they want to achieve a soft landing, they feel that they can start to move policy from what we might term restrictive, acting as a break on overall economic activity, to one where they can lift their foot off the brake a little bit, just allow policy to get to a more neutral level, to give the economy a bit more breathing space to keep growing, uh, avoid a recession, but also still get inflation on track. So um, I think there's still scope that they can do that. And I think another 25 in November, another 25 basis point cut in December would not be incompatible uh, with that story at all. And indeed, we still look for the Fed funds, uh, the Federal mm -hmm. Reserve, to cut rates down to about three, three and a half uh, by the summer of next year. Okay. All right, uh, James, very quickly, before we let you go, what about the U.S. presidential election? Who's going to be good uh, for global equities? And uh, if you could comment on India as well. Yeah, I mean, the, who's the general going to be better, James? Who, who, who's <laughs> going to be better? <laughs> 
Well, it's a tricky one, isn't it? I mean, um, you know, the, the proof is in the pudding. You know, it's fine getting all these proposals, but what actually gets delivered? Uh, and in the very near term, we've got to remember this new president's not going to take over until next year. So we're still going to have a, you know, a good month and a half or so where it's down to Fed policy, it's down to the domestic economy that's really driving equity market sentiment. Uh, but in general, I, I would say that a lower tax environment that Trump is proposing relative to a higher tax, particularly the higher corporation tax uh, environment that Kamala Harris is proposing would be potentially positive for the US equity market and the US growth story. But then again, of course, Donald Trump is proposing tariffs and that could actually be quite detrimental to the US consumer. It's going to put up prices, could be quite inflationary as well, could necessitate interest rates to be somewhat higher than under Kamala Harris. So you get something with one candidate and something different with a slightly different other candidate. So there's no, there's no guarantees on this. I think both <laughs> You know, there's reason for positivity, but I think there's also reasons for negativity for both growth and equity markets for both candidates as well. Mm. <clears throat> I think, Nigel, uh, you know, there's, there's, I saw one estimate that if uh, Trump won, he'd mm. add seven and a half trillion dollars in U.S. deficit over the next 10 years. Mm. If Harris wins, that's three and a half dollars, uh, three and a half uh, trillion dollars. Uh, to U.S. Uh, fiscal deficit over the next, this is over the next 10 years. In terms seven, of seven trillion and three seven trillion. Seven and a half and three and a half. Uh, over Trump. 10 years, over the next decade. Yeah, so Trump is clearly expansionary. So which means it's he's clearly the better, uh, I mean, uh, theoretically, the better one for stock markets, right? Bond yeah. markets, he's negative. Kamala Harris, of course, uh, you know, is, is also going to spend, but lesser than Trump. But start with the tax cuts, right? I mean, she's saying that, uh, sorry, the tax hikes. Yeah. Uh, that uh, corporate America needs to pay more taxes. So I guess that's the big the, one. The way I look at it is uh, Trump, businessman before politician. So it'll always be good, right, in terms of spending, in terms yeah. of expansion. This is one thing, though. He's mentioned, I think, recently, also two weeks back as well, with uh, his talk. I think he mentioned India somewhere. He said, uh, because his basic contention is, day one, I'm going to do matching tariffs. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you are charging, uh, you know, X percent on some imports from the U.S., I'm going to do that to your uh, exports into the U.S. as well. So, I mean, uh, you know, good certainly for U.S. stock markets, but emerging markets, I mean, I think uh, it, it'll have to be more nuanced in that sense. Uh, James, great to have you with us here. Thank you very much. If you can uh, hear us, appreciate it, uh, as always. We take a quick commercial break here. We've got lots of stock-specific action that we want to track uh, in our top, top 10 segments. So, Emphasis, Crystal, Colte, Partle, GMR Airports, Bikaji Foods, RVNL, Railtel, Cop, and uh, Nalco are some of the stocks which are on our radar. Uh, Bajaj, l &T Technology Services are stocks which are on our radar on the uh, back of some negative uh, news flow. Uh, 